Current climate models predict major disruptions of fresh water supplies around the globe. The Keck Hydro Watch Center, funded by the WM Keck Foundation, is using the Angelo Reserve to gain a deeper understanding of the hydrologic cycle and field test techniques for predicting the availability of fresh water. Their work could also have a profound impact on the accuracy of future global climate models. Inez Fung is the leader of the Hydro Watch team. I asked what I thought was a very simple question. How old is the water in the stream? Is it from yesterday's rain? Is it from last year's rain or this season's rain? Or is it 100,000 years old? I don't really know. Uh, and so this is, this is what we're trying to figure out is how long the soils can hold onto the water, how much of it comes out through the trees and through evaporation from the soil return to the atmosphere, and what is the size of this reservoir beneath our feet. Rain falling in a watershed can take many paths. It can be intercepted by the forest canopy or fall on shallow soils and evaporate back into the atmosphere. It can sink into the soil, be taken up by plants, and be transpired back into the atmosphere. Or it can flow deep into the ground, be stored in the rocks, feed a nearby stream, and eventually return to the ocean. The moisture that returns to the atmosphere will often fall again, as either rain or snow in a different watershed. The HydroWatch team, which includes atmospheric chemists, plant physiologists, soil scientists, water hydrologists, climate modelers, and electrical engineers, is studying every phase of the hydrologic cycle. Todd Dawson is a plant physiologist with the team. The thing that really draws me into this project and the thing I'm, I'm most uh, intrigued about is really looking at the life cycle of water from its origins at the ocean as it moves onto land and it, and it falls into watersheds. What's the fate of that water then? What gets into the groundwater? What runs off in the stream? How much of it is snow? How much of it is fog? How much of it is rain? How much of it is used by the trees? What gets stored? And all the chemistry and the dynamics of that movement of water. And that's something that just hasn't been done very often. And I think it's largely because it requires a whole variety of different types of tools and expertise. And so any one investigator would only be looking at one piece of that. They wouldn't be able to look at the entire picture. And the HydroWatch project is really focused on trying to look at the whole picture. And so, and hopefully we succeed. The area's heavy winter rains and long dry summers make the Angelo Reserve an ideal laboratory for studying how ecosystems use water and how that changes with the seasons. You got it, yeah, you got a bullseye there. One of the objectives that we have as the plant biologist in the project is to get our instrumentation into the trees themselves. So first what we have to do is get ropes up in the trees and often we ask an arborist or someone on our team to rig the trees. Once those ropes are into the trees, then we can take up into the canopies, the solar panels that help us charge the batteries that we run, much of the equipment that we use on the site. And then we can also take up these little wireless nodes as we climb up on the ropes, and we can put them in various places within the canopy. So we can keep it inside the canopy, we can put it out on the outer edge of the canopy, which is more sunlit, we can put some near the ground, some at the very top of the tree. And that's a really critical component for this watershed study. There's so much microclimatic variation down through the canopy that we really need to understand what is the magnitude of that variation. How much does humidity and temperature vary over the course of a season, over the course of a day? Because those are the drivers for water moving out of the forest. In addition to monitoring how the trees use water, the team is also following water movement under the ground. So for example, over here, we have what we call resistance probes. And these go down uh, to two meters, and they're at 10 centimeter intervals, giving us a pattern of how water is wetting, drying up the rock below. We also have wells. This well goes down to about uh, 30 meters. And the reason that we have this well in here, like the seven other wells, is that we want to get in uh, to the ground as far down as possible, as deep as possible, to see how uh, the water table responds to rainfall events and then how it responds over the long, dry summers. 
Data from all the different sensors flow to radio transmitters and are relayed back to the UC Berkeley campus where researchers can monitor the changes in real time. The ultimate goal is to provide a model for monitoring watersheds throughout the state and across the country. So what we're talking about here is developing not just the data, but the prototype for monitoring. So the modes will be automatic. We can place them, we go out to the field, we figure out where to put them, and then they could transmit the data in real time. So you can check, they beam the data home every night, and so you can sit and check whether they're all working and what is happening, and if there's a rainstorm coming, you can go and change the frequency of data transmission. The team doesn't just track the amount of water flowing through the watershed, they also trace the water's history. Staff at the Center for Stable Isotope Biogeochemistry on the Berkeley campus can track the path water takes through the hydrologic cycle. As water undergoes evaporation, condensation, or even sublimation into things like snow or ice, it changes its isotope value. When it changes its value and it falls into the environment, we can use it like a tracer, just like you would use dye to see where those plants are actually getting their water from. Is it deep groundwater? Is it surface water? Is it fog water, for example? Each of those have a unique stable isotope fingerprint, if you will, that we can trace through the trees and trace through the watershed. And so that's, that's a measure of how much the plants transpire. Fung and the other modelers on the team will use the data collected in their wireless watershed to build models that will allow them to predict water availability, much like meteorologists use satellites to predict the weather. We do hope that we get differences uh, among years during this watershed study, because what that does is it allows us to run the model using different parameters. And if you have the different parameters, that gives you the power then to make better predictions. The team's work will also have a major impact on global climate models. Until now, soil moisture has been a missing element in these models. The HydroWatch collaboration is already producing new insights about how plants use water. Roots of plants are probably the most flexible organ that a, a plant makes. They pretty much can put them wherever they want, and they're really about finding resources. So roots will grow towards water, they'll grow towards nutrients. When they find that water, for example, then they can shift it around and move it in different ways, not only towards the leaves, which uh, are undergoing transpiration, but they can shift it around within their root system as well. So for example, many plants that live in Mediterranean types of climates, like we have here in California, they have a set of roots that are very deep for exploiting moisture during the dry summer periods where it's really stored, say in the groundwater or perhaps in this rock um, water that we're trying to quantify. They'll move some of that water up and sometimes they'll redistribute it into the shallow roots that are taking up nutrients. And so there's this really interesting dynamic of water movement. The question that has always baffled me is why some trees can withstand a drought. And that's one of the things that we're after. And one of the surprises that we have found so far is that the trees may be more resourceful than we had anticipated, that the roots actually dig down to hunt for water and they fracture the rocks. And so, in so doing, enable their own survival through a drought. And so if that is the case, uh, then that is something that we're not, we do not have in the models, is this very smart IQ of trees. Scientists have been developing climate models for more than two decades. Unfortunately, many of the predictions in their models have already been realized. Fung's ultimate goal is to avoid the troubles she sees looming in the future. We've been predicting climate change for over 25 years. It is scary when the ice sheets melt, when the glaciers melt, and this is part of our prediction. It is scary when we see more severe storms, when we see temperature changes that are consistent with our predictions. One of the reasons I'm so keen about this project is that we have to bring it down to the scale of how people use water, how much water will be available to them, how much rainfall there's going to be, and what the stream flow is going to be in the future. So it's not just about global warming on the global scale uh, uh, for the year 2100, but it is more about the availability, how the global warming will change 
the water availability to people in the next two or three decades.